Welcome to Securing America with me, Frank Gaffney, the program that's a kind of owner's manual for protecting the country we love against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to God's glory and that of his kingdom. The plot sounds like something picked from or plucked from a spy thriller, two operatives claiming to be U.S. security personnel but suspected of ties with foreign enemies were recently arrested. They had stashed a small arsenal in a luxury apartment near the U.S. Capitol from which they were cultivating relationships with White House Secret Service personnel. Who Haidar Ali and Aryan Tahazardeh are working for is unclear at the moment, but they may be part of an Iranian plot to exact revenge for the liquidation of the mullah's top terrorist, Qasem Soleimani. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is among those reportedly being targeted for assassination. Incredibly, a magistrate named Michael Harvey rejected prosecutors' request to jail these suspects, instead releasing them to home detention. Since an inside tip foreshortened the investigation into their operation, we cannot fully assess the danger of doing so. To discuss all of this, to put it into a larger context of threats to our country, here inside the United States, uh, whether engineered by foreign adversaries or domestic ones, I'm very pleased to welcome back one of our regulars. His name is Charles Sam Faddis. He's served our country with great distinction in a whole number of capacities. Uh, notably, uh, is an undercover Central Intelligence Agency operative. He knows his way around the business of well, the tradecraft, I should say, really, of spying, running operations, and doing um, our nation's most secretive and sensitive, sensitive work. Um, Sam Faddis, it's great to have you with us, especially to have a chance to pick your brains about this subject, which I know you are focusing on like a laser at endmagazine.com. Welcome back, sir. Great to be here, Frank, as always. Thank you. So, Sam, who are these guys? What do we know about uh, Ali and Tazar Hadzadeh, and uh, what are their, you know, likely ties, as far as we can tell? Well, uh, Arian Tahirzadeh, uh, I think, is a United States citizen and appears to have lived here at least most of his life. Uh, Ali I set, represents himself as being Pakistani. It's unclear to me whether he's Pakistani or Bengali, but anyway. Um, and uh, look, both of the, you know, here's the here's the essence of it to me, is that uh, a lot of the media, I think, sort of wants to portray these guys as just kind of eccentric and grifters, and this is some kind of con. Um, everything we know about these guys, the equipment they have, what they were doing, suggests that this is a lot more serious than that. To begin with, these guys weren't getting anything. They were actually giving things to other people. So, they, you know, a con usually uh, is financially the rewarding other way. to the con men, not the other way around. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of reason here, I think, to think that these guys could very well be Iranian operatives here to help the Iranians make good on the threats they've been making for two years now to get revenge for killing Soleimani, the Quds Force commander. You, you mentioned in your uh, uh, your piece at End Magazine about all this, Sam, that uh, there is a, well, perhaps coincidental um, timing issue here uh, with the start of this operation masquerading as U.S. Uh, you know Department of Homeland Security special you know security officers, um, and uh, and you know uh, Soleimani's. Uh, well, liquidation, as I put it. Talk about that a little bit and how that might play into all of this. Well, basically, this whole thing with these two seems to have kicked off about a month after Soleimani was killed by us. Again, the Iranians have made no secret of their intention to get revenge and get revenge in a very, very high profile, big way. Um, that, so we we have that. We have the, the focus on the Secret Service. We have this intent to co-opt the Secret Service. Ali has multiple trips to Iran, to Mashhad in Iran. Mashhad in Iran happens to be the location of an Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force base, which uh, coincidentally, not coincidentally, trains Pakistanis 
that they recruit for operations on behalf of Iran abroad. One of the things they train people in there. Operations uh, meaning terrorist operations, would you say? Absolutely. I mean, the Quds Force is basically the, you know, the, the arm of the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps that carries out terrorist attacks abroad and works closely with terrorist groups like Hezbollah actually creates terrorist groups. So one of the things they do in Mashhad is train snipers. They run a 45 day course there. I would note that in the apartment, one of the many things, incriminating things that was seized was a spotting scope like are routinely used by sniper teams. I don't have any re- reasonable explanation why Ali, who is a Pakistani and represents himself as being a businessman in the United States, happens to bounce back and forth to Mashhad, Iran. Of course, as you know, it's all all unresolved at this point. Yeah, it, it is unresolved, and, and that's something I want to come back to. But just one other data point, and I can't remember whether it was in your reporting or others, but uh, there was um, apparently a time when uh, this chap Ali was boasting that he worked for Pakistani intelligence, the uh, so-called ISI. Uh, is that confirmed as you understand it? It is confirmed definitely that he was claiming to be Pakistani uh, intelligence. And I, and I would say there are a lot of indicators here that at least somebody, if not both of them, at least one of them, had some significant tradecraft training. There are things that they have done here that show these guys were pursuing things in a pretty analytical, pretty organized way, the way a trained operative would. Right, including uh, understanding surveillance and how to counter efforts to surveil their activities. Absolutely. Um, and Sam, you spent a lot of time in Pakistan when you were with the agency. Um, how formidable an adversary is uh, the Pakistanis' ISI? Well, the ISI is definitely a, a, a very formidable, very large, and, and really in many ways a very professional organization, if they are in fact involved in this. I mean, at this point, I guess I have a question mark as to whether there is legitimacy to that or Ali was making that representation because somehow that was advancing his, his other agenda. I just don't know. Okay. And, and you mentioned that Mashhad is a place that the Quds Force of Iran trains Pakistani operatives. Uh, is there reason to believe that there might actually be some uh, direct cooperation between these two arms of, uh, of you know, jihadist governments, uh, albeit the Pakistanis being of the Sunni stripe and the Iranians, of course, being of the Shiite. Well, I mean, I, as I understand it, the, the actual Iranian interest, interest section in the nation's capital is housed in the Pakistani embassy in Washington, D.C. So we have there, that's that's a pretty there, good. There is some cooperation. <laughs> that's right. That would be a tell, I think, in the uh, intelligence business. Um, one of the other things that you've uh, mentioned, Sam, in one of your pieces is evidence that uh, these guys may have been able to operate another, well, safe house, if you will, uh, besides this uh, luxury apartment they had uh, blocks from the Capitol. Um, give us just a quick rundown on that, if you would. Well, as you indicated, these guys went, figured out when, when the FBI put surveillance on them in advance of, of busting in and raiding the place, these guys were able to detect that surveillance and were aware they were under surveillance. And they began to move items out of the apartment, mail them out because they knew they couldn't walk out the front door without being stopped, but they figured the FBI wasn't searching the mail. They started to take, obviously, therefore, what are the most incriminating things and get rid of them. One of the things they mailed were empty weapons cases for weapons that were not located in the apartment. So nothing but the plastic boxes you get a pistol in when you buy it. Uh, They're not illegal, but they wanted to get rid of those. That was their number one priority. Why? Because, Because the FBI wouldn't find those weapons, and that would mean the FBI would know, well, those weapons are somewhere else, which means we have another safe house. Hold that thought, Sam. We'll be right back with more with Sam Faddis right after this. (music) 
Welcome back. We're talking with Sam Faddis, a distinguished former clandestine services operative of the Central Intelligence Agency, the author of an important book on his experiences there, The Decline and Fall Beyond Repair, The Decline and Fall of the CIA. He is also the driving force behind a terrific online resource. It's called andmagazine.com. You can follow him there at Substack. Uh, Sam, we're talking about an operation uh, within blocks of the United States Capitol um, by people whose exact purposes are unclear, but it was clearly a well-financed and ominous uh, undertaking, not least because it does appear that they successfully penetrated the protective details of the Secret Service, including that of the First Lady of the United States, uh, Jill Biden, and uh, the White House itself. Um, as a guy who used to do this kind of thing for a living, tell us what that suggests is the nature of the problem for individuals, as I understand it, have been put on administrative leave from the Secret Service. Um, how serious a problem do you think this represents? Yeah, I think it's a massive problem. I, I, I think everything in this case tells you that you're very likely looking at an Iranian operation intended to assassinate a senior official in the nation's capital. Everything says that. These guys, uh, when I see everything that was in the apartment, it looks to me like everything you would expect to find in a safe house with a team that was doing what we would call the casing in preparation for an ultimate hit. The fact that they developed this relationship with the Secret Service guys and got it as far as they did uh, is shocking and says some really not <laughs> not good things about the CI consciousness, counterintelligence consciousness of, of the Secret Service. And they were apparently tipped at some point. They received, when the FBI was focusing on them, they received an email, as I understand it, from a member of the Secret Service, which in some way or any other it tipped them to the fact that an investigation was ongoing. That remains a little hazy. But that raises a zillion questions of its own. Why is the Secret Service guy in the middle of an investigation emailing the targets at all? And, and what would possibly have been in that email that would have tipped them? Why would he be disclosing this? So you're not just talking about guys that maybe didn't have their guard up enough in the Secret Service. But now you begin to wonder, have, in fact, some of them really been compromised? Were, were they were they in league with these individuals? I, you know, I would be, I would be suggesting the Secret Service turn the place upside down. You not just suspend these four guys, but you need to get to the bottom of how far this goes. Well, and and how big a problem this is. If if as you say, and I'm I'm sure it's correct that that tip did uh, require. Um, action to grab these guys before the full investigation ran its course. Um, the ability to figure out whether there were other operatives uh, already here as well, whether they were beyond the point where they were simply casing the joint or, or setting up uh, a strike of some kind. Um, those are the sorts of questions that uh, obviously inquiring minds want to know at this point. But it, it goes to something that we've talked about many times and other contexts, notably, of course, uh, in connection with communist China and uh, its operations, Sam, its elite capture, uh, especially. Uh, and that is, what is the state of our counterintelligence uh, at the moment? Uh, this this particular <laughs> operation, I guess, was uh, evidently uh, rolled up, at least initially, by a United States Postal Service inspector who, through an unlikely set of circumstances, simply tumbled onto um, these guys. And uh, that led to uh, further investigation by others, including the FBI. But are we really uh, asleep at the switch here or worse, as your comment just now suggests, maybe even having people who are supposed to be at the switch complicit in um, endangering us? Well, I think at a minimum, we're asleep at the switch, right, Frank? I mean, you know, the, that, that, that would be the best case. That's how horrible this is, that all we're looking at is, is shocking incompetence. I mean, if you're Secret Service agents, obviously everything about you, your information, your duties, and so forth 
That's very sensitive information and incredibly valuable to any adversary. And you ought to just have your CI antenna up all the time. Anybody who's buddying up to you, cozying up to you, buying you presents, that ought to set Giving off Giving you a rent-free bell. luxury apartment for a year. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, I, that's a little bit be, of a clue, don't you think? You ought to be reporting that guy the next day, running his name and, no and telling your boss about it. That's what yeah. you ought to be doing. And if you shouldn't, I mean, is that not grounds for separation from the service uh, at the very minimum, if not actual prosecution? Well, it ought to be ground. I, I don't know exactly what their rules are, but if their rules don't require that, then they absolutely should. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sam, let me ask you about another aspect of this. As I mentioned in the opening comment, um, this magistrate judge by the name of Michael Harvey has seen fit on the basis of the evidence that has been presented thus far, some of which seems very troubling for the reasons that you've outlined. Uh, these guys, uh, really, there's no evidence of, uh, of a violent crime, uh, and they should be uh, released. Um, he unfortunately hasn't let them go entirely. He's set them loose on bail, but put them in home detention. What does that say about the uh, mindset of, in this case, a single judge, I guess, but more generally, the degree to which we as a society now fail to appreciate actual threats to our homeland that could be very, very dangerous indeed. Yeah, uh, it's it, it's shocking. As you've suggested to begin with, we don't know that these are the only two guys, right? I just said that based on their actions, I would think there's at least one more safe house. You have no idea how many of these guys there are. If they're trained intelligence operatives, one of the things you're trained to do is vanish and disappear, exfiltrate yourself. So sending them home and asking them to hang out doesn't mean they're they're going to stick around. They were caught with a with gear to make fake IDs, put vehicle uh, tracking devices on vehicles, uh, multiple firearms. They're acquiring data on Secret Service protective details of the president and the first lady. Somewhere in there, you don't think there's enough information to suggest really strongly that we need to hang on to these guys. So. Uh, it, I, it, it certainly I, seems that way to me, I've got to say. I, I don't think this is just incompetence. I mean, I think there is at a minimum some political political bias here. And personally, I think that this guy and probably a lot of the media want to bury this story because Joe Biden's getting ready to give away the farm to the Iranians again. And one of the things he's talking about doing is lifting the terrorist designation on the IRGC. And it would be really embarrassing to discover that the IRGC simultaneously is plotting an assassination in the nation's capital while he's surrendering in Vienna. Yeah, it's a perfect send up to our next conversation uh, with uh, Dr. Harold Rode is uh, what this administration is prepared to do uh, to ignore um, provocations and uh, and affronts as well uh, and dangerous threats indeed from Iran in pursuit of this deal. Um, lastly, very quickly, Sam, uh, you will remember that uh, this uh, Pakistani intelligence service was implicated I think very convincingly, uh, frankly, in an IT congressional scandal, um, it, it, it simply vanished uh, as a practical matter. Was that another example of uh, political considerations trumping, um, well, common sense national security? Yeah, I think absolutely without question. Hey, this will be inconvenient for us to address with the Pakistani government. Let's just pretend it didn't happen. That's what that is to me. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say, uh, at the time, this is now five or six years ago, as I recall, Paul Ryan was the uh, Speaker of the House, and he didn't want any part of uh, raising, I think, an appropriate alarm about what, in that case, exclusively Democratic uh, members of Congress had done to rely on, uh, it seems, Pakistani operatives for their intel uh, IT services. A scandal. We ought to revisit it against the backdrop of this. Sam Faddis, thanks so much for your work and for joining us to talk about it from time to time. We look forward to doing so with you again next week. Next up, as promised, we'll speak with one of the country's preeminent experts on Iran and the Middle East, Dr. Harold Rowe, right after this.
we're back, and I'm thrilled to be able to say we're joined by one of the country's preeminent experts on the Middle East, a uh, longtime duty resource for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, um, a man we are privileged to uh, consider both a friend and a valued resource of our Center for Security Policy, for whom he published a terrific book, Modern Islamic Warfare. An ancient doctrine marches on. His name is Dr. Harold Rode, catching up with him in Jerusalem. Well, welcome back. It's I'm in Edwards. Florida. <laughs> I beg your pardon. We're catching up with him, not in Jerusalem, but in Florida. Well, we're, we're glad to have you wherever you are. Nice to be here, Frank, as always. I have a couple of things that I want to hit with you quickly and not a whole lot of time, Harold. Let me start by asking about the conflict that erupted on the Temple Mount uh, in Jerusalem today. Um, it is uh, just the latest incident of rising violence, it seems. First of all, does this constitute, do you think, the makings of a new intifada at the hands of the Palestinians? And have they been encouraged to engage in renewed violence along those lines by the Biden administration's policies? It's hard to know whether this is going to be a long-term thing, but here's why it's happening. The Palestinians see both the Israelis as indecisive and the Americans as weak. And in the Middle East, when you see weakness, you pounce. So I don't know where it's going to go, but we can see this continuing as long as the administration here keeps pushing the Palestinian agenda, which the Gulf, um, al uh, Israel's and America's Gulf allies uh, don't want don't want and, and in fact worked around with the Abraham Accords, of course, and uh, this administration has reverted to the idea that the centerpiece of American policy must be the Palestinian agenda. And I'm afraid that, as you say, does uh, con constitute an, an impetus to them to uh, behave badly. Um, this brings me to uh, a second question. Uh, that same perceived irresolution on the part of the Israeli government and the proclivities of this administration here in the United States seem to be emboldening the Iranians as well. We were just talking with Sam Fattis about what may be an operation by them to kill one or more senior American officials, um, including through the penetration of our Secret Service at the White House, no less. Um, talk a little bit about the deal uh, that is still a borning, uh, if you will. And um, what are the, you know, purposes of the Iranians in pursuing um, that deal? Is it is it about our humiliation? Uh, is it about uh, ex obtaining uh, tremendous concessions from them and, uh, and, and also in the process undermining the U.S.-Israel alliance? Absolutely. It's a little hard for us to understand, but if we want to understand what motivates Iran, we got to look at things the way the Iranians look at things. The Iranians what are a concept. Yeah, well, well we, I didn't detect that very much in the past in government, but it's even much less today. Now, uh, what what's the bottom line here? They're Muslims. Uh, from their point of view, America and Israel are working together. Now, we don't know whether it's America calling the shots and um, or is it Israel calling the shots. I'm talking as an Iranian would talk here. Um, now, in uh, Vienna, uh, the, the fact that it appears that America is doing everything to abandon and to weaken Israel, the Iranians will take advantage of every opportunity to try to do this because they know that the non-Muslims are one nation. We all work together against the Muslims. Even a lot of secular Muslims think this way. Now, uh, uh, that so... Is it possibly that Israel is calling the shots in Vienna? I know this is absurd, but I'm trying to explain it as it, it does. It does sound not only absurd, but just preposterous on the grounds that what clearly the Israelis want is us not to be making a deal with the Iranians. Well, we know that, but here's the thing: maybe um, America is directing Israel to make all these uh, uh, raids in, in in Syria against Iranian prospects. Maybe America is directing Israel to target 
all uh, um, so many um, Iranian scientists and bases in Iran. Um, if since all non-Muslims are working together, this is a united front. Now, I again, I know this is absurd. I only wish it were so. <laughs> it seems as though we're more of a divided front. But Harold, the the, the larger point is this: uh, it, what the Iranians may think is again a matter of. Uh, you know, speculation, but what they're doing clearly is they're holding out for more and more and more concessions, uh, billions of dollars, uh, which will, as you know, uh, flow into their weapons programs, including nuclear weapons programs and their terrorism. Uh, and they are, it seems, uh, determined to, at the same time that they're demanding these concessions, um, taking steps, uh, perhaps including this plot to kill Americans here senior Americans, former if not present, um, that bespeaks a, uh, a confidence that they can do anything and get away with it, given the, you know, again, the determination of this administration to get a deal. I think you're right. Um, there is a, the, the great Bernard Lewis, the late professor of Middle East history, used to say, they spit in our eyes and we say it's raining. We choose to ignore this and by choosing to ignore us, what they're doing, and then they've got all the patience in the world. They know how to wait. We need things now. We need it done. But the, in, the Iranians and most of the Middle Asians, patience, they know how to wait. So the infiltration into all sorts of American institutions would not surprise me in the least, and that they would wait for their opportunity and strike. And I think, I, I can't know this, but Logically, from an Iranian point of view, when the opportunity comes, they will inflict damage on our leaders. Yeah, here inside the United States, uh, not least. And and this would be what they would consider to be uh, an eye for an eye, I suppose, uh, in their tradition, um, having taken out one of their top leaders, arguably one of the most malevolent forces in the world, uh, Qasem Soleimani. Um, Harold, to the extent that um, Israel is now uh, in the throes of a, another political crisis, uh, and I'm not talking about the possible intifada, I'm talking about just the internal dynamics of the uh, coalition government uh, falling and, and what comes next, uh, make book for me on how that plays into these perhaps life and death issues for Israel of, uh, of an incipient Iranian nuclear capability, as well as uh, perhaps many of their proxies, not just the Palestinians, but uh, Hezbollah and Hamas and, uh, and Syria, um, taking the opportunity to uh, mortally threaten Israel in this moment. The way they think. Um, the Israelis, I would only say one thing, they don't have the uh... Uh, uh, opportunity to delude themselves. They know what's going on. The country is by and large a right-wing country. They uh, believe in standing up for themselves. I assume that will happen and again, again. But the political system is even crazier than some of the things that we are witnessing in Washington. It's more convoluted. And so uh, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. Well, what I'm most concerned about is while we wait to see what happens uh, in terms of a new government uh, or new elections, and and it, you're you're clearly right, Harold, that um, it's a center right country. It's just that it can't quite express that decisively in the uh, in the elections uh, so far. But but the bigger point is, uh, would you anticipate, Harold, that in the absence of clarity about who's in charge, they can possibly act uh, as decisively as I think you're right, they need to in the face of these emerging threats from Iran? I would hope that they can. I'm tech, again, I'm not a military guy. I'm not an ex-military expert. But military experts that I know say that Israel was quite capable of taking care of the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, let's hope they have the guts to do what is necessary. Yeah. Well, let's hope they do and, and uh, you know, that we don't wind up interfering with those uh, efforts as well. Harold, you mentioned a moment ago the uh, Gulf allies, uh, 
they've been sometime allies uh, oftentimes, but relatively speaking in the Middle East, they've been more reliable friends than an awful lot of others. Um, specifically, I'm talking about Saudi Arabia, I'm talking about the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain. Um, all of these nations have been under attack by the Houthi terrorists who, uh, again, as part of the concessions leading, they think, to a deal with Iran, the Biden administration has removed from the terrorism list. Um, do you anticipate that the, that notwithstanding their clear um, anger with this government, that uh, the Gulf states are now sufficiently aligned with Israel in dealing with this Iranian threat, that that will be sustained? Uh, again, uh, I, I, I pray so, but uh, what's your assessment of where they stand today? My assessment is that behind the scenes, to quote the, the former Israeli ambassador to, to Washington, if they can have the 800-pound gorilla on their side, that is the Saudis, the Bahrainis, the uh, Emiratis and all, then the 250-pound gorilla works quite fine. They wanted to have, they, they had this summit in the Negev, which um, was supposed to be... Harold, I'm out of time. I, I think you just mean to say that the uh, the Israelis are the 250-pound gorilla in this context, and uh, let's, let's hope they're up to the job. Harold Rode, thank you for your insights on all of these things. We're going to have you back when we have a bit more time. Uh, thank you for your time today, and a very uh, meaningful Passover to you, my friend. Thank you for taking the time on this day to talk with us. Thank you. God bless you. Next up, we'll speak with Rick Fisher about China, space, and Russia, right after this. Welcome back. A special welcome to our next guest, who I consider to be one of our country's most thoughtful and most clear-eyed analysts of the Chinese capabilities to project power and to achieve, ultimately, their goal of doing so globally as the world's dominant power. His name is Richard Fisher. He is a senior fellow with the International Assessment and Strategy Center. He is also um, a very important author of a book entitled China's Military Modernization, Building for Regional and Global Reach. He's also the author of countless articles on various aspects of what the Chinese are up to. Of particular interest uh, to us today is its military space program. And we're going to talk with Rick about that um, and more. And Rick, it's so good to have you back with us. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Frank. I want to start by just asking a little bit of um, uh, a bank shot, if I could, of uh, to discuss, if you can, the Chinese ally, Russia, and its military space program, how it has evolved, and in particular, how it is now affecting in the wake of the Ukraine invasion and our retaliation uh, against Russia for engaging in it, in terms of a potentially mortal threat to the International Space Station, uh, and then we'll get to what it might mean for the Chinese. Okay, Frank, yes, uh, happy to do that. Uh, Russia emerged from the Cold War in 1990 with an already developed uh, counter space capability. They had direct ascent from the Earth, anti satellite weapons, and co orbital weapons that would circle the Earth until they caught up with their target and explode or do something to affect the target. And that uh, capability remained through the next 30 years, but in the last decade, Russia has taken to developing these capabilities again. So today, Russia has better direct ascent anti-satellite weapons and better co-orbital weapons. Now, the United States and Russia and many American partners in space are cooperating on the $100 billion International Space Station, or ISS. 
and the United States spends about three to four billion dollars a year to support this I, this space station. Uh, the Russians, however, uh, are ready to leave it and have been uh, thinking about how to leave it for, I would say, over 15 years. Uh, they, since the mid 2000s, they've been producing briefings on how to separate the Russian half of the ISS from, from the American half. And uh, the pressure to do so, however, has come to a, a real breaking point with Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine and his desire to subordinate all of Europe to Russian control. Uh, the director... Of and, and there's the, no question in your mind that is his ultimate ob- objective. Absolutely. Uh, and now we have the director of the Russian space program, Dmitry Rogozin, basically issuing uh, regular threats to leave the ISS. Uh, they haven't really interfered in the function of the ISS yet, but the threats are, are of, a, of a nature that it is, it is possible, very possible, that if uh, Vladimir Putin faces a point of desperation in Ukraine where he has a choice, uh, I really need to use nuclear weapons to scare off uh, the Americans and the Europeans from supporting the Ukrainians, or should I turn the International Space Station into a Molotov cocktail and have it crash down on Earth? This is where we are now, and he could elect in lieu of using nuclear weapons to crash the International Space Station as, as a power demonstration. And, and how would that be accomplished, Rick? If the, if the Russian half separates, does that mean the, the American half is unable to maintain its orbital position? Well, Frank, it would be very, very simple to do this. Uh, first, evacuate the Russians in one Soyuz space capsule, and then send up uh, another Soyuz space capsule uh, to simply fire its uh, uh, rockets to put the International Space Station into an uncontrollable spin. Uh, that would very quickly break the space station. It's, 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 it's a robust structure, but... Uh, not designed for spinning. <laughs> yeah, not designed for spinning and, and maneuvering. And it would break, and uh, it would take a long time to descend uh, to Earth, and it would create a very large debris field. Wow. Uh, and presumably, if there were no uh, rescue capsule uh, available, there would be a loss of life of those who were not Russians uh, and, uh, and resident on the space station at the time, no? Yes. Uh, the Russians could very quickly uh, seal off their half. So, you know, maybe... Maybe they will give the uh, Americans and their partners a day or two to uh, evacuate, provided we have the means to evacuate everybody, uh, uh, and and then just light off uh, their remaining capsule and uh, break up the station. Um, Rick, this is a terrifying thought, uh, frankly, and uh, one that I, I don't know that others have uh, mulled, but it does seem as though as part of a sort of scorched, scorched earth policy that uh, Putin is certainly applying to Ukraine. Um, this may may well be uh, something they countenance. Um, we're going to talk, Rick, on the other side of a short break about um, what this might mean for uh, Russia and China, which has its own international uh, or national space station, I should say, uh, and clearly the ambitions to use it as part of a program of uh, space domination. And there are a few people who have studied this uh, more carefully and I think, again, more thoughtfully than you. And I'm anxious to get your thoughts on, first of all, what the Chinese are up to in this uh, space domain, but also uh, what the Russians might be willing and able to do to help them become the dominant power, both up there and down here on Earth. Uh, We'll talk about that and much more with Rick Fisher, the author of China's Military Modernization. Uh, It's all about their global reach. And we'll get into all of this and more on the other side of this short break. (music) 
Okay, Rick, thank you. I dragged that out a little bit, but we got it done. Um, so I didn't get the tweet about Hunter Biden, but let's just pivot to the, the China piece because I think we'll, uh, we'll have plenty to talk about there. Um, so we'll go for another seven minutes and 40 seconds. All right, here we go. Welcome back. We're continuing a hugely important conversation with Richard Fisher. He is one of our, as I say, duty experts on matters involving China's military modernization, but he's also deeply knowledgeable about other contributors to instability and threats to our country, uh, including those emanating from Russia. Rick, you've just uh, laid out a very frightening scenario about what the Russians might do to punish us uh, and demonstrate that they can, uh, well, kick us in the teeth, I guess one might say, with impunity, um, not with nuclear weapons, but with the destruction of our space station. Uh, there's another nation that is an interest in um, uh, space stations and a whole lot of other things in the moon and cislunar space, um, and that would be communist China. Uh, again, you've deeply studied what the Chinese have in mind. Give us sort of an overview of what that looks like, uh, and then we'll talk about what the Russians might do to help them achieve their amb ambitions in the high frontier. Well, like the Russians, the Chinese, which have who have uh, based their early space program, at least, on Russian technology, have taken many lessons from the Russians, not the least of which is that anything that they do in space must support strategic and military ambitions on Earth. And so the Chinese have fashioned a dual-use, manned and unmanned space program. Everything that they put into space, that they build, <clears throat> can support... Their, their military ambitions on Earth, which is essentially to achieve hegemony on Earth, to subordinate all other nations. And the Chinese have demonstrated uh, fairly frequently over the last decade that they also understand that dominance of outer space is absolutely necessary in order to achieve hegemony on Earth. Hegemony in space must support hegemony on Earth. So for China... And what does that look like in terms of hegemony in space as uh, the Chinese see it? Well, hegemony in space, first and foremost, requires control of the Earth-Moon system. It, mu it con requires control of the Moon, uh, the Lagrangian points or points of e equal gravitational balance uh, around the Earth and the Moon, and it requires control of access to Mars and eventual dominance of Mars. And for that matter, as technology allows mankind to go farther into our solar system, to Jupiter and beyond, China will want to be in the dominant position on, uh, on the moons of Jupiter, uh, in uh, the choice asteroids that uh, yield the best minerals, and, and on and onward. And China is working right now to achieve dominance on the moon. Uh, the United States may actually return to the moon first during this decade, but starting at about 2030, the Chinese are going to launch a blitzkrieg to try to take first, uh, the, the, the most advantageous strategic positions on the moon to try to secure the most advantageous points of water and mineral resources, and uh, then go on from there. The United States and China are today in a race to dominate the moon, although uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not clear to what degree the Biden administration understands that, that fact. Yeah, or or even supports it. Honestly, uh, the the question I guess I have, and I'm I'm heartened to hear you say we might actually get back there first. Uh, the Chinese sim seemingly are are bending every effort uh, to, as you say, uh, put themselves in a position to colonize the place. But 
Um, is there any sign that the United States has a similar um, goal in mind uh, that we would actually not simply return and explore and all of that, but we would establish a permanent presence that would be designed to try to exclude uh, what the Chinese have in mind for the place? Well, the United States uh, over over the Trump and the Biden administration has tried to portray uh, its lunar programs as peaceful, not seeking confrontation, trying to enlist as many uh, international partners as po- possible. The, the Artemis program, I, I think, now has up to uh, uh, 12 partners. That's, that's pretty good. The, uh, the, the Chinese only have one partner, Russia. But that's, that's a very powerful partner in terms of uh, space, space technology and the ability to help the Chinese stay ahead of the United States. Right. And, and in keeping with what you just said about, you know, really the Russians now deciding that they're going to separate from us, literally in the case of the uh, space station, but more generally in this uh, uh, cooperative venture of uh, international space, what does that mean for the Chinese? Uh, what benefits will accrue to them, especially in terms of advancing this uh, domination agenda? Well, in, in almost any area of space endeavor, uh, the Russians are just advanced. They're, they're cutting edge. But what they lack is, is the money to, to fund follow-through programs. But whether it's nuclear space propulsion, uh, advanced habitats on, on the moon or Mars, uh, or heavy lift space launch vehicles, the Russians can make them for you if, if you pay them, and they can make very effective products. So the, the Chinese want to maintain an independent capability in all these areas, but as they've proven in their military modernization program, they are, they are more than willing and able to purchase Russian technology to incorporate and accelerate their own developments. This is a subject to which we're going to return with you soon, Rick. I think it's so vital that we understand uh, the implications for what happens here on Earth of what's going on in the heavens. We appreciate your expertise tremendously and your time with us today. Godspeed, my friend. 